hopefully everyone's introduced to a few new faces. Um, I'd like to open today with our state of the industry panel. Um, we've got a great lineup of investors coming to talk to us about where they see investment in the mining sector. So I'd like to invite Peter Grosskopf, uh, CEO of Sprott Inc. to the stage, Sean Kwan Lee, Portfolio Manager of Oppenheim Gold and Special Metals Fund, Kerry Smith, Senior Mining Analyst at Hayward Securities, and Ethan Levine, Managing Director, Co-Head of Natural Resources at Common Fund Capital. Gentlemen, please take a seat in any order. So let's just get a steer of uh, where things are at the moment. 2017 seemed to be a bit of a positive end to the year for the mining sector. Um, we had a London show just a month ago where some of the um, uh, investors commented that um, this year was looking at more of an inflection point for the industry. Um, I'm not sure where our investors see things at the moment, but Peter, perhaps we could start with you. Where do you feel we are right now in the investment cycle? I, st I, I think it's still early days. Um, I guess the, the one point I would look to is that many of the active managers in the sector have pulled in their horns due to redemptions or uh, even having funds unwound. So there's a real lack of specialists um, in, the, in the sector right now. As a result, lots of companies have found themselves with registers that are shrinking in terms of the number of shareholders that are involved. I, I don't think the generalists have really come in yet. So I think we're early days, actually possibly um, still closer to the low with, with lots more to come. I do think there'll be a rebound for, for many different reasons. And do you, do you know why perhaps, or do you, can you speculate why the generalists have sort of not come back, come back in yet? Do you think it's people got perhaps burned off the end of the last cycle and they're a little bit hesitant to, to, to throw in right now? I think the momentum or the moves in the sector have not been consistent enough yet. Um, Everybody's chasing other areas that are hotter, whether it's gold, whether it's uh, cryptos or, or cannabis, <laughs> so or, uh, candy, yep. or 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 just technology stocks, which have performed still quite well, relatively. Um, there's just been a, a, a lack of impetus to for a generalist to, to to move into mining. It's a volatile sector. It's it's hard to, to pick stocks in it, and uh, uh, they haven't had to, so they just haven't. Uh, haven't participated in the last, last uh, four or five years. Certainly. Shankan, uh, what's the view uh, from your side? I think in the gold area, there are a couple of uh, negative things need to be cleared out uh, before the gold going up. Number one is uh, Fed policy, that's everybody know. This year probably continue, people talking about three times, hiking four times, there's a lot of arguments. That's one of the big hurdle there. Second one is US dollar. Worldwide, people thinking US dollar probably getting stronger, is not weaker. If this also add more on the gold on the negative side, it's instead of its positive side. So I think if you really look at the third one, worldwide, the political situation Whatever you call, you know, North Korea nuclear crisis now is uh, looks like also we don't know what's the final result, but uh, it's better than the war threat, or whatever. And I look at worldwide as a hot point. Actually, you know, I cannot say getting better, but some area a little bit is stabilized. So if all this is put together, there's not a lot of really trigger for the gold to big jump or whatever, rebound. So that's, this is pretty much the micro view. And if end of this year, there's no any surprise, I think the gold is pretty much flat. Or maybe one time spike, whatever the event triggered, maximum probably around the, let's say 1350 or something. That's my personal bet. Of course, we don't know there are some big surprise happen. Suppose the US, if Donald Trump really in trouble or something happen, that's probably big, good thing for the gold, of course, for the economy, we don't know. So there are some events probably will trigger the gold spike. But I don't bet it's long-term hold there. Big spike, 
It happened before, big spike and then come back quickly. So that's a bit much my bad. Okay, thanks. Uh, Kerry, um, how's things from your side? How's uh, the view from Toronto? So from, from the, the sell side, which is where I work, I would say, I agree with Peter, the funds generally are flat to redemption, so that makes it tough for them to put new capital into the space. But I think that you know the bigger problem in the industry has really been, for a long time, we've had really very little in terms of returns. You know, the returns on invested the returns on invested capital in this business are historically terrible, as people know. And and I think what happens is, you know, when you've got a business like that, and and uh, you know, we're 60 basis the mining sector is 60 basis points of the S and P. So there's really not a reason for an investor to own a mining stock unless he really feels compelled to own it. And even in Toronto, you know, we're less than 10% of the index. So people can get away with not owning these stocks and not get hurt in a market that's generally been going up, which is what's been the market for the last 10 years, let's call it. So I think, you know, from the industry's perspective, you have to be able to deliver a return, and returns on invested capital are typically pretty low. We went through a market in you know, the late 90s into the early 2000s before gold tanked where people were just chasing ounces. So if you, the more ounces you produce, the higher your valuation. And, and that market is not, that market's not here anymore. I mean, people are now interested in free cash. They want to see your cash flow per share. They want to see growing cash flow per share. And that's very tough in a cyclical business. And, and the other thing I would say is from, from the investor side, what I see in the business is, when the, when the market's strong and the gold price is high or the metal price is high, the investors want everybody to get levered up. And for me, leverage is a killer in this business. Like I don't think any mining company should really have any debt. And you're seeing it in this cycle. Every big mining company had a lot of debt. And when the, when the market turned, they couldn't do anything in terms of acquisitions. And there were a lot of good acquisitions available. And they couldn't do anything because they were trying to pare the debt down. So I think you need to have you know, a very unlevered balance sheet. I think you need to, to recognize that when the markets are strong and the gold price is, is strong like it was in 2011, we were 19, over 1,900 an ounce. In that market, I never talked to one director of one mining company that said, I want to sell some assets because I think the market is closer to the top than the bottom. And for me, as a mining engineer, I look at that market and say, $1,900 gold is a very good price. I think I would have been selling some of my assets that were either high cost or short mine life and try to raise cash in a strong market when other buyers could actually raise capital to buy your assets and then take that cash and redeploy it when the gold price tanked, which is, I agree with Peter, I think this is where we are in the cycle. It's very early. Gold price is struggling along here between you know, 12 50 13 and a quarter, and, and it doesn't seem to be able to really make any headway, but I think generally the trend for me is higher. And I think we're sort of in the early stages of what should be a pretty good bull market in gold. But it's going to take some time, and, uh, and people are going to get frustrated along the way, which is what you see happening. Clients capitulate. They just start selling stock. And when they're selling and there's no buyers, the stock's going down. And that's what happens. Because the resource guys aren't getting capital in to be able to support the market. And until I think, until I think we get gold, you know, Chan Kwan's saying 1350. I think we need to get up close to 1400. There's a number there that will trigger the average journalist to come into the space, and, and we're not there yet. Thanks. Um, and you mentioned uh, companies uh, growing a cash flow per share. Uh, do, you, do you see that as a long way off as well? You know, companies are generating ca decent cash flow per share. Like I, I would say the companies in my coverage universe actually generate a reasonable cash flow and trade at a reasonable multiples, but nobody cares because you know, the average investor out there, the speculative capital that's chasing these sectors certainly in our market, has been chasing right. cannabis stocks, Bitcoin, and, uh, and blockchain, and those kinds of names. And, and those names have done well. People have made a lot of money in those sectors. And when they can make, you know, a speculative guy, a guy that's looking for risk capital, if he can't double his money in 12 months, he's not going to be around. And they've been able to do that in those sectors. And they haven't been able to do that in mining. So the risk capital for early stage mining ventures isn't there because it's, it's chasing other names. Mm. And I think that's the other difference in our market is the, uh, you know, the North American market, the valuations are all pretty modest. Stocks are all, I would say, closer to the bottom half of their 52-week highs. Australia, by comparison, those stocks are all generally near their 52-week highs because that market, I think, has been significantly better, partly, I think, because they don't have cannabis stocks and they don't have uh, you know, blockchains so much. And, and those guys, you know, the risk... <laughs> 
but but the, you know the, the the risk capital in Australia, I think, is is prepared to put money into mining companies. Right. Is that is that sort of a cultural thing you think with with Australia? Nah, I think it's just a function of where the returns were. Yep. Fantastic. Uh, Ethan, uh, it's the first time with us. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your role at Common, uh, Common Fund and, and where you see the investment cycle at the moment. Sure. So I, uh, I work with uh, Common Fund Capital. I uh, head our private natural resources fund and efforts there. We're a broad asset management firm. On the private capital side, we manage about, uh, we've raised about $16 billion over time. About three of that is in the natural resources sector. That's a broad uh, mandate, including oil and gas. Uh, power, renewables, ag, and timber, but mining makes up a big part of that. And the way we invest is kind of multifold uh, on, in exclusively kind of like <coughs> private type investing, although in the mining sector that it does include kind of illiquid public companies as well. Um, but we're investing in funds. We're also co-investing directly into companies as well and assets. Um, and so I, I guess to kind of uh, uh, echo some of the thoughts here about our thoughts on the mining sector, I mean, I think we are in the early stages. Um, you know, we, we're in about kind of year two-ish of, of the recovery. Mining cycles are longer. Um, kind of the bull cycle can last six, seven plus years. And so what you are beginning to see is um, some fuller pricing for already producing assets. I think from an investment standpoint, there's still compelling opportunities to be had on the, the earlier stage, the development end of the market. Um, and that's where we're probably spending more of our time right now, although there can be some uh, interesting opportunities on, on, the, on the producing side. Why has it been a slower recovery? I think, to, to echo Kerry's point, I mean, investors look back on returns, and I'm not just saying mining, I'm talking natural resources returns over the past five, 10 years, and they're horrible. Um, people are looking at their five, 10 year return and they're saying, why do I even need this in my portfolio from an allocation standpoint? Um, you know, they forget about the inflation hedging capability, the, the diversification capability, um, and, the, and the potential alpha generation capability. And I think that has uh, forced, you know, certain investors to, inst on the institutional side, and that's the, uh, the typical um, client investor that we have as institutional investors, to really decrease their allocation to the natural resources sector. I think mining ends up being a tougher allocation in general across the private natural resources side. Um, and, uh, and, and then if you have like a, a decrease overall for, for private natural resources, you're just gonna see that effect uh, more broadly. Okay, so it seems like we're at quite an early stage, um, but uh, we talked about these triggers, uh, these macro triggers or trends that are gonna sort of kickstart uh, gold uh, or, or maybe the, the whole mining sector. Um, it's hard to ignore Trump and the sort of trade relations, um, uh, US-China trade wars when we talk about macro trends. Um, does anyone have any comments on, on that, Peter? Do you have anything around that? Do you think that's going to be a significant impact to the metals, mining materials business? I would put it in a more general context. Um, broad financial markets, both debt and equity, have done well for the past nine years. We all know that. Uh, there are cracks, and the, the biggest issue that we have with it is that the mathematical equation of the total debt levels across all economies, um, mostly now in the sovereign end um, versus GDP, uh, is just an unsolvable equation. We all know that, and people just seem to accept it. And I guess the only way out is really to, at some point, for the central planners to encourage inflation. So the question is, what market will crack first? to create a, you know, a rush effect into natural resources. We think it's gonna happen. We think it's gonna happen quite soon, but we've been saying that for, for years. And uh, markets can always take much longer and the pendulum can swim much further than one would expect. So when you look at the events, whether they be trade wars or uh, political events or socialist parties taking power unexpectedly or, you know, many, many other dozens of events that have occurred, and, and, and markets just seem to go, what? <laughs> it's like the old mad comic, me worry, you know? So it, it's just, it's that kind of attitude right now, and just when the market is most complacent will be when the biggest accident happens, and so we're just kind of biding our time, making our investments, staking our ground, until something 
dramatic happens in one of those other markets. Certainly. Um, and uh, what, what do you think about China and sort of their supply side reforms and um, the sort of moves by Xi and this sort of pro policy? Um, Shang Khan, are you well positioned to take this? Yeah. I just came back from China two weeks ago. And I think uh, I toured uh, several, almost uh, seven cities. And when I saw there the situation, indeed, there's something changing. However, it's not like the people thought it's going to be changing fast. But it's uh, like a semi-central planned economy. You know, the government is very powerful. It set up the policy, try to change the pollution, try to, let's say, really uh, rationale the resources, reallocate the resources, put the restrictions on a certain kind of area, particularly on a resource area. When I like to really go there to see, you know, the big challenge for the Chinese economy is the housing market and the debt issue. The housing market, although it's, there's still very strong demand, people want to buy the housing, but indeed it's pretty much speculative. Uh, if you say there's no bubble, that's not true. There's uh, cannot be that less expensive. Larger cities, small cities, everybody want to build the house. You know, this is uh, think this way. Entire nation, if most of the wealth put into house, this is a big structure issue. So this is really related to the commodity price. And uh, if you really look at the base metal area, I thought uh, if you try to imagine like uh, five years ago, the base metal area, big soaring, probably will won't happen like that. And uh, plus, if you really look at it, another worry to me is the Chinese economy. They have to really very slow motion to make this bubble getting smaller, smaller. You cannot dramatically to pop this bubble, to make this bubble explosion, the economy should be in blow, you know. And plus, the debt issue, same thing. So like the Chinese policy cannot, you know, they don't want the economy suddenly crash. At the same time, they don't want the economy so hot. So this is really difficult to control, you know, those kind of policy. It's really, you know, worldwide, hardly to find those kind of, you know, central bank, whatever, the government, they think in a lot of ways to try to make this thing smoothly to move, let's say three years, five years. A little bit, of, I don't know, is at some point, if you really lost control, that's going to be disaster for the Chinese economy, but also for the worldwide economy. So this kind of situation really, that's one of the risk side. I would like to add on is, talking about the US dollar getting stronger. So it's really worth to watch. Whenever the US dollar getting stronger, they always cause troubles. Some country will have something wrong. This has already happened in the some emerging market. You watch it, if the US dollar getting stronger, stronger, there's some countries in serious trouble. Suppose, you know, at that time, if you borrow a lot of money from denominated by the US dollar, think of this way, if US dollar getting stronger by 15%, when you try to pay back the debt, how much burden you're gonna carry? So emerging market in particular, and also worldwide, the liquidity, there's a lot of money you know, across the border much easier than before and faster. If one, let's say, big money allocator, you know, suppose the money, you know, thinking about the US economy getting stronger, they grab something in the US, not only the real world, but also the financial products. So this is gonna make the US dollar getting stronger. Where the money came from? They have to really sell somewhere and get the money, put it back into the US. Some country, if not strong enough, when the capital outflow, it's gonna cause a serious problem. So that's another area bad. Probably will trigger certain kind of nervous and make the gold probably pop up. That's quite possible. So really worth to watch the emerging market. 
So that's pretty much my personal view. One other thing that, that I would like to add, if I can, just to, uh, to Shanquan's comments. So I think there's going to be a premium in this market on, on asset quality and asset location because there's a lot of geopolitical things going on out there. And, you know, there's a lot of elections coming up, like Turkey's having an election, Mex Mexico's having an election, Colombia's having an election. And a lot of, that, a lot of what's happening out there is going to... I think drive people in this next market to to asset location, and I think if you're in you know North America, Canada, Australia, parts of Europe, I think people are going to pay a premium. They don't pay a premium today, and you don't really have to pay up today to own some of these assets in some of these jurisdictions. But I think that that will happen because I think there's going to be a lot of change out there that's that's going to scare people, and people are going to be nervous about putting capital into certain parts of the world. So. You know, if you're in if you're in a third world country or if you're in a difficult jurisdiction, it doesn't mean you can't function there. The quality of the ore body has to be strong. You need good good government relationships. You need good relationships with the locals, and uh, if you can do that, you can manage. But I think the trick is is getting yourself to the point where you can actually get your asset into production. Because once you're producing, then the government will generally leave you alone. It's w you're vulnerable when you're not producing, when you're not really employing people, you're not paying taxes to the government, you're not paying royalties. That's when you're vulnerable. And, and that's where it, it gets really tricky. Okay. Ethan, do you see much risks in emerging markets for the investments you're placing into? Um, yes, yes and no. I mean, I think, I mean, to, to Kerry's comment, I mean, there are, there are political wins that it's difficult to predict, right? And so I think when, you, when uh, mining companies, uh, management teams are thinking about, okay, where, wh what do I do? Wh how do I, how do I make my project more attractive? I think the further uh, ability to advance a project towards completion, um, whether that be a key permit or something like that, that, that significantly mitigates some of the risks um, that you might see coming into a, 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 an emerging market. Um, you know, I, th I think, you know, not every geography is created equal. Um, but it's difficult to predict, um, you know, and especially in the mining sector, when you know the cycles can be long. It can take um, several years to get projects through into into production. Um, there can oftentimes be multiple elections throughout that uh, that time frame. And so I think there is, you know, from an institutional investor standpoint, uh, a bit more of a bias towards uh, visibility on projects, whether or not. Um, you know, that project's going to come into production in, in another year, another two years, versus, you know, very earlier stage exploration, I think, is, is a tougher sell um, for institutional investors uh, in the emerging markets because cause you don't have that level of visibility. You don't have that clarity. And, uh, and folks are looking for, uh, especially at this part in the cycle, attractive risk returns. I mean, I think as, this, as the sector rebounds, um, there's going to be more of a willingness to take increased risk for 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 uh, potentially the same level of return, but at this point, there's not there's not a need to do that, um, and so having greater visibility into into kind of that path forward, I think, is critical. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, look, we've got about five minutes left. I want to open this to any questions from the audience. If anyone has any questions, just raise your hand, and uh, we can come around with a microphone. Has anyone got anything burning that they want to raise at the moment? One down the front. Here. I wonder if everyone would quickly comment on tax tax change policies that are going on around the world as they see it. For 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 me, for sure, some of the African countries are getting worse. You know, Zambia is trying to increase the taxes. Um, Tanzania has been terrible. The U.S. tax reform was pretty helpful, and uh, I think, for me, I think generally in the first world countries, I think. The tax reform is going to be neutral to positive over the course of time. I think you, it's always more difficult in third world countries. I think they always tend to try and, and raise taxes, not lower taxes. That's a pretty general comment, but that's my, how I feel about it. Any other thoughts on tax? I think the tax issue related to the each country, the basic economic situation. If you look at it worldwide, so many countries really run into, into very tight budget and also there's they need the money. There's no any other way to really lower the tax, particularly government. If they really want to 
the debt if already piling up, already very high, there's not a lot of room to really play out. So they have to really squeeze, you know, increase the tax. That's pretty much uh, most of the, if you look at uh, Africa countries particular. And uh, some uh, countries probably there's some room to lower the tax, you know, follow the U.S. step. That's a pretty much uh, uh, relatively developed country or the economy really strong. They have the power to really either borrow money or try to lower the tax. We will not uh, create a lot of trouble. They're going to do it. So they're going to fall off, try to compete with, uh, you know, uh, in the corporate level, you know, try to make uh, their country's corporate level very competitive. So the tax issue actually really uh, country vary. I have to really look into the detail for the each country. There's no any general trend worldwide so far. So I, I view it. Okay, a any further questions? Yeah, there's one more down here. This one is for Shang Quan, please. Um, it specifically relates to China. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the new environmental policies in China have tightened up metal prices around the world. Right. And my question to you is, um, at what, how much further can it go before China relaxes its environmental policies? I think uh, so far, there's uh, very difficult uh, to relax the, the environmental, you know, standard is getting tougher and tougher. Let me tell you, although they did a lot of work, but the condition changed a little bit. It's not that much yet. Whenever I travel to China, you know, when I come back, I always sick, cough all the time. You can see the air quality. The air quality indeed is very poor, you know. So if you, if you really look into the detail, there's a lot of work to be done water pollution, the soil pollution. Not only a single one, you simply lift almost every area. Water, air, you know, those kind of things take a longer time. You know that whenever you pollute your environment, take much longer to get back. If they really start, you know, did a little bit of work and then lose the policy again, that's gonna be disaster for the Chinese for the future. So I, I, I bet, you know, this policy probably will take much longer. They, they rather prefer lower the economy growth even to 5%, but it cannot pollute. This is already, I cannot say only the Communist Party have the view. This is the entire country. Pretty much people realize those kind of growth is not for, for China, it's really bad for the future. So that's why I thought those kind of policy probably will continue for a much longer time. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so I just want to wrap up. We've got about a minute left and ask everyone on the panel, um, if we had sort of a, a bit of advice for the mining companies here in terms of what they should focus on, in terms of what they should keep going with, um, um, in terms of good progress, we know that we're at the very early stage. Um, what, what would be that sort of number one area? Um, Peter, let's start with you and we can work down. Uh, that's, a, that's a tough leading question. Um, I, I would say um, m mining companies will have to focus on delivering either their projects or their cash flows, as Kerry said. Uh, they will have to continue, as other industries have, to improve governance and uh, what, what's going back to shareholders in terms of uh, uh, less overheads, more, more dividends, and... I think uh, probably the most important thing is to set realistic guidelines for projects because um, time and time again, the companies that hurt their investors the most are those who have set unrealistic guidelines for their projects. Everybody knows it costs more, it takes longer. And um, I would say as shareholders, what we just like to see is a management team that can set out a schedule that they can hit and they'll be rewarded with an appropriate multiple. Um, Kerry, uh, Shankan, sorry, we'll work yeah. down, yeah. To me, I think uh, particularly for this uh, conference, you know, and uh, I think the 60 something company is a pretty much early stage. I view the early stage company exploration probably, that's the big uh, uh, major focus. 
my view is like this. If you can discover the good deposit, there's always someone interesting to buy it. So I would say, I agree with a lot of what Peter said. You need to focus on returns. You need to try and return capital to shareholders. You need to keep your overheads down because I see it more and more every day. The clients, the first thing they do when they pull out the, the circular every year is they look at the, the compensation. And, uh, and the compensation tends to be higher than what they think it should be. And particularly at the bottom of the cycle, you know, they want to see compensation tied to stock. More to more tied to stock, less tied to cash. When the, when the market's good, they don't mind paying people a lot of money. So I would think you want to keep your overheads down, try and spend the money as productively as possible. And I would say, the other thing I see a lot in, in my sector is boards, you know, I, when I look at a company, the first thing I look at is the board. And, and I would say most of the time the boards are not very good, and the boards tend to be buddies and friends of the CEO. And, and I would say what you need to do is you need to have a board that's independent. You need to think about, as Peter said, good corporate governance. And for me, I always see the mistakes that are made are made by companies that have boards that I would say are average and or maybe less than average. I think the companies that have good, strong boards, that have a lot of diversity on their boards, I think those are the, those are the companies that tend to do better in the market. They tend to get better valuations. And uh, for me, I think it all comes down to the people. And you need to have a strong board. Don't, don't have your friends on the board. You know, get, get guys that, that, that can help really help your business because it's a tough business, as we know, and uh, the cycles take a long time to play out. And if you've got a short asset, a short mind life asset, you better make sure you get it right because you're, you could miss the window, to be quite honest. Uh, costs, costs, and costs. I think, you know, ability to drive down uh, initial capex, drive down all in sustaining cash costs, being a first or second quartile producer, there's always going to be demand uh, from buyers for world-class assets, and I think that really goes to the core. I mean, yes, volumes are important, but the costs um, and where that fits in on the cost curve is, is going to be critical um, for uh, generating demand for that asset going forward. Okay, fantastic. So uh, there's quite a lot covered there, um, quite a lot to be focusing in on, but I hope you can leave some positive uh, comments from that as well. Um, I'd just like to say thank you very much and a round of applause to our panelists.